How's it going guys? I'm Joe and this is something they probably should have taught you in school. Today's lesson is why investing is not optional in my opinion. And if you're someone who has said, I don't want to bother investing in stock market, it's too risky, definitely stick around. Before I get into why the stock market is not exactly as risky as most people think, I want to make two important points. The first is that by not investing, you are simply letting your money get eaten away like a cancer by inflation every single year. And the second point is in a way, you are still investing even if you're not realizing it, so you may as well make some choices with it and have control over it. First of all, let's cover the horrors of inflation, which is basically the decrease in the value of money as a result of the government printing more and more money and increasing the money supply. Most people, and I'm sure you do, you know about inflation. You know it's a little under like 2%, but you choose to ignore it. You're like, eh, 2%, whatever. I'm not really too worried about that. But it's worse than you think, and it's eating away your money like a cancer every single year. For the past decade or so, inflation yearly has been around 2%. But historically, it's been around 3% on average. And you might think, ah, 2%, who cares? I don't care if 2% of my money goes away. I'd rather just have it in the bank, keep it safe. But it adds up and it compounds. You know about compound gains people are always talking about? Well, there's also compound losses from inflation. Let's say you're saving for retirement and it's in 30 years or so. And let's make up an amount, $10,000 is what you have in the bank in cash, a reasonable chunk of change. And I'm not saying this is where you're finished saving, this is just where you're starting at. With inflation, and let's say a generous 2% per year, compounded over 30 years, that $10,000 becomes the equivalent of just $5,400. In that 30 years, you would have to have $18,000 to have the equivalent of that $10,000 of what it is today. And if you're saving long-term, even if you're saving regularly and putting cash from every paycheck into your bank account, if you just keep it in cash the whole time, it would be like cutting your income in half and saving half the amount of money. And I know there's probably a lot of young people out there thinking, oh, 30 years, what, 30 years? That's never gonna come. Look, you are going to retire at some point. So it might be better to think of if you keep it in cash, it's like saving and cutting your money right now in half. And also, if you're worried about losing money in the stock market, well, guess what? You're getting a guaranteed loss by just keeping it in cash. Now, I do wanna make a major caveat, which is that I'm specifically talking about long-term savings for like retirement. I'm not talking about short-term emergency funds where if you have like three to six months plus in cash in the bank, ready to go if you ever need it, then obviously that's not a huge deal because that's a smaller percentage of your net worth and you can kind of replenish that with 2% of your income, not a big deal. But if you're keeping all your savings, your entire net worth in cash, it's a huge effect. All right, so that was inflation. And my second point was that you're investing without realizing it. And what exactly do I mean by that? Let's say you live in the United States and obviously you're keeping all your money probably in US dollars. Let me ask you this. Why don't you convert all of your money into Canadian dollars or euros? Obviously, it's gonna be the currency that everyone in your country uses, it's what you get paid in, but currency exchange rates are changing all the time. The value of your money is changing all the time, constantly. And even though it may not seem like you're invested in the US dollar, you are. Let's take a look at an example. Around the year 2000, one euro equaled about 86 cents of the US dollar. By 2008, that almost doubled to $1.57 per euro, and right around now, it's about $1.17. So if you had lived in Europe during that time, the value of your money compared to the USA almost doubled, but you probably didn't notice it because all the local prices stayed around the same. But of course, if you did some traveling to the USA from Europe, you definitely would have noticed. But my point is, there was a huge change in value of your money, even though you just kept it in cash and you thought it stayed the same value. And if your country, for example, goes through higher amounts of inflation compared to other countries, that could actually have a very dramatic effect if your country experiences hyperinflation or something like that. And obviously that may be low risk in much more developed countries, but it still is a risk and you are choosing to take on that risk by keeping your money in your country's currency, whether you like it or not. But yes, admittedly, keeping your money in cash in a currency is certainly less volatile than the stock market. But here's the next major segment of this video, which is investing in the stock market is not nearly as risky as people think, especially and specifically long-term. And I wanna be clear, you do not need to know a single thing about picking stocks, picking the best stock. In fact, usually the best thing to do, especially long-term, is to just buy an index fund. So what exactly is an index? And I'm making the distinction between an index and an index fund here. An index is basically a list of stocks 
put together to be used as a measuring tool to kind of approximate different sectors, how well sectors are doing, or maybe how well an entire country is doing as a whole using those stocks making up that index as the measuring stick. For example, the S&P 500 is made up of 500 of the largest companies in the United States from all different sectors. So when people talk about the stock market, usually they're referring to the S&P 500, but sometimes also the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is only made up of about 30. And there are many indexes out there for many different purposes. For example, there's also the NASDAQ 100, which has a lot of tech stocks in there. There's the Dow Jones, which I mentioned. There's international indexes like Japan's Nikkei 225, the UK's FTSE 100, and Germany's DAX, which are kind of like the equivalents of the S&P 500 in those countries. Now, next, there are index funds, which are basically things you can buy that essentially track the indexes. You can't buy the index specifically because it's literally just a measuring tool. However, you can buy index funds. It's a very subtle difference, but essentially an index fund is kind of a collection of stocks put together in the same ratios as the actual index. So when you buy it, it's basically going to perform the same exact way as the index itself. For example, for the S&P 500, there are tickers such as SPY, VU, and IVV. And you could log on to your broker and search for one of these and buy it just like any other stock. And when you buy one of these, you're basically buying one share of the collection of the entire pool, which again is made up of the same ratios as the index. And those tickers I mentioned all do follow the S&P 500, but they're products made by different companies. For example, SPY is made by Spider, VOO is from Vanguard. But theoretically, if the S&P 500 goes up 1%, then all of those should also go up 1%. And they do pretty much follow that exactly. Basically, buying an index fund is a way to automatically diversify without having to choose the individual stocks because you're basically by buying one share of an index fund buying a little piece of each company in those funds and then putting it all together into one share so why is buying an index fund better than just holding in cash well, looking historically, for example, for the past 100 years or so, the S&P 500 has averaged a return of 7% per year, and that is including and adjusted for inflation. Now, obviously, past performance does not guarantee future results. Just because the average is 7% doesn't mean it's gonna stay there. It could be higher, it could be lower. But look at the risk reward of the two options you have. You have 100 years of history of positive returns of about 7%. Whereas on the other side, you have inflation, which is basically a guaranteed loss of two to 3% per year. Now, one big thing is people always look at the historical crashes. I mean, even the one we had in early 2020, it's understandable, it's scary to see money drop that much. But with long-term investing, you're not doing it all at once. It's not like you're putting all your money in one go and then worried, oh, if there's a drop the next day, yeah, that would suck. But if you're investing a percentage of your income every single month, yeah, you're gonna buy some tops, but you're also gonna buy some bottoms and it'll average out. This is called dollar cost averaging and it's basically the best way to invest. You're averaging out the peaks and drops, so you're getting the average. And as the old saying goes, time in the market beats timing the market. But even still, you might be skeptical. So let's look at an absolute worst case scenario. Let's say you started investing in the S&P 500 in the beginning of 2000, right at the peak of the tech bubble before the crash. Looking at the chart, you might think, oh my God, I would not have had a positive return on my money for 13 years. What a ripoff. That's not worth it. But that's not true because you should be investing consistently during that whole time. So by the time the index reaches a new high, you'll actually be up on your money because your cost basis average is lower than that because you did buy some at the bottom. And remember that whole time you would have also been getting dividends, which you should automatically reinvest. This is called drip. Usually it's sometimes in your broker, a setting that you have to Enable, but you can automatically reinvest the dividends, which the S&P 500 index funds do pay out. But now let's do an example that's more for fun and it's even more worst case scenario. And I'm gonna test this using a dividend reinvestment calculator from the site I found. And let's say that you invested one lump sum of money in April 2000 at the peak of the bubble and you didn't invest anything else the whole next 13 years. However, you did reinvest the dividends that were paid out. In February 2013, your return without the dividends would be just 3.5% over 13 years, that's basically flat. I couldn't get it exactly using the calculator because the data wasn't available, but you get the point. But because the S&P 500 dividend yield 
during that time was around 2%. If you had reinvested all the dividends the whole time, you would be up 31%, even though the chart looks like it's flat. You're up 30% on your money. And that's with investing just one lump sum at the beginning. Now it's important to point out that that is not adjusted for inflation. If we do adjust for inflation, even with the dividends, your total return in that time would be around negative 3%. Now that does sound kind of bad, even though it's sort of flat, you still lost money in 13 years, what the heck? But think about this, what was the alternative? Keeping it in cash? During that time, inflation was averaging 2.36% or a total loss of 35% in purchasing power over that 13 years. So even if you did the worst case scenario, you invested at the peak in 2000, you didn't put a single dime into it anymore, but you kept reinvesting the dividends, your money would be about roughly the same worth after 13 years, as opposed to the safe option of keeping in cash, and then your money would have been worth 35% less. Now, I obviously can't cover everything in this video. I didn't even touch on bonds. But if you're new to investing, you've never invested before, the best thing I think you could do would be simply buy an S&P 500 index fund, buy it, and then never look at it again for 30 years. And for God's sake, do not watch financial news shows. It's all pure garbage. So I hope you guys found this video helpful about this stuff they should have probably taught you in school. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. If you guys want to keep watching, the next video I would recommend is one where I was talking about how can the stock market possibly be going up if the economy is doing crappy. So I'll put that link right there. You can just click on it. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.